So we are in this worship series here, uh, halfway through it, of wrestling the money monster. And the last two weeks, Pastor Mo and I have had a chance to just lift up some of the scriptures in the Old Testament that speak to how do we think about money and, and possessions in our lives. And I got to engage that from Proverbs two weeks ago. Um, and some of the money habits that scripture invites us to consider versus focusing on appearances. And last week, Pastor Mo uh, lifted up the powerful words from Ecclesiastes. And with such great stories and insight, um, we pray that this is a series that's just letting us reflect a little bit about how does this function in our lives um, as followers of Jesus, as people who honor God, who look to God in our lives. Well, today and next week, we're going to go to, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And today we're going to hear from Jesus um, as he talks um, with uh, a group of an individual and then some others listening in. Um, a man comes up to Jesus and Jesus has been teaching for a while, Ben, uh, and crowds have been drawn to him and, and they've come to recognize him as a wise rabbi. And a man comes to him with a problem, an inheritance issue in his family. And uh, so he goes, in, in that day, inheritance was handled um, according to biblical law among the Jewish people. And so you would sometimes go to a rabbi to ascribe to say, how, did, how should we handle this situation in our family? So this guy comes up to Jesus wanting some practical guidance. And Jesus steps back from the practical guidance, but gives him a broader perspective, gives us a broader perspective. Let's hear God's word. Let's hear Jesus' word for us today. This morning's reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. The reading may be found on page 865 in the Bibles you received as you entered. We invite those of you here and joining us online to follow along in your Bibles. Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have enough room to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, <clears throat> and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you work for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week... Pastor Mo mentioned the rapper Biggie Smalls and his song, Mo Money, Mo Problems. And I must say, I didn't know that song very well. <laughs> I am not that into 90s rappers. But I do know this song. For those of you who don't know, that was Pink Floyd's Money. And yes, I was in third grade when it came out. So it wasn't necessarily something I grew up on either. But, but there are songs about money from every era. Because it is, literally and figuratively, the currency of our life. Money. We use it daily. Rather than going to the grocery store with a five-gallon jug of gasoline and saying, hey, I'll trade you this for these 
12 grocery items, or rather than going to Home Depot and saying, hey, I need three four by eight sheets of plywood, could I sweep your floors for three hours and then take these with me? Rather than bartering or exchanging service for items, we use money as a means of exchange. It's simply a tool to make life simpler. Rather than trading our time or trading an item, we use money. It's a tool, just a tool. Or is it? Because of what it represents, because of what it can accomplish, money begins to take on an authority, a value, a power. I could take this green piece of paper and light it on fire Let's see if I can turn this thing. And most of you would just wonder, oh no, is he gonna set the sprinkler system off? And be a little nervous about that. But if I pulled out a different piece of green paper and considered lighting this on fire, my guess is you would have a different reaction. There is something about this stuff it has power, not just because of what it does in the world, but it begins to have a power in our own lives. Money has value, and we need to treat it with respect. Two weeks ago, I talked about, from Proverbs, the scriptures that remind us that God's word guides us to develop healthy money habits rather than to get caught up in appearances of what it can make us look like. Scripture invites us, challenges us, God does, to use those resources in our lives wisely. But today Jesus is reminding us of another truth. And what he is telling us today is that money and our stuff can take on a spiritual power, a dangerous power that can mislead us, can divert us, and can even undermine our relationship with God. A man comes to Jesus, we heard in our scripture today, and asks him to mediate in a family inheritance situation. Teacher, he says, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Friends, if you say, oh, money is just money, stuff is just stuff, it doesn't have any more power than that, pastor. Well, just talk to a family that has gone through an inheritance issue that didn't go well. A situation where one or another of people in that family said, that isn't fair. A situation where families have been ripped apart because of some trinket that grandma had or some amount of money that they didn't feel was divided fairly. I saw hints of that in my own family growing up. When my Dad's mother passed away. She basically had nothing. And after the funeral, her six kids gathered around in her kitchen table and they basically said, who wants the pots and pans? Who wants the refrigerator? And in an hour, they had divided everything up and went to a funeral luncheon and just celebrated stories of grandma. On the other hand, I saw on my mom's side of the family, when my grandpa died, he had been a farmer. He had some farmland. He had some machinery. He had some other stuff. There was more. And I also saw more tensions in that family as they were trying to sort through and divide those things up. After my dad died a couple of years ago and I was the executor, 
the thing I said to my siblings is I said I have one goal in the journey of the next year is that our relationships are better at the end of this year than they are right now. Because I've seen what has happened in so many other families. By the grace of God and my siblings' understanding, we navigated through and we enjoy being with each other just as much an hour more than we did before. I'm so grateful. But Jesus didn't want to be a probate judge. What he did want to be was a teacher. And he turned the conversation from figuring out an inheritance issue to stepping back and looking at the bigger picture. And what Jesus said to the man back then, he says to us today, beware, Jesus says, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. But hold on. If it isn't measured by that, what is it measured by? I mean, how many times haven't you said or you heard someone else say, I wonder what he or she is worth? It's a phrase we use in our culture. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about net worth. We're measuring by exactly the scale that Jesus says, don't measure by. Jesus is saying, that's the wrong tool for measuring. That's the wrong scale to look at. I think Jesus would point us to these. What is the impact you have made on people? Or what is the good that you have done in your life? What is the love that you have shared with your neighbor? See, Jesus is telling us to make sure we're using the right measure when we're assessing our lives or others. But so often we get caught up in the measurement that our world often uses, which is net worth versus love worth. Life is not measured by how much you own, Jesus says. What measuring stick do you use? Do I use? When I look at people's lives, or maybe even more importantly, when I look at my own. Then Jesus goes on to tell this fascinating little story, this little parable. A farmer is doing well. He doesn't have enough room in his barns. So he makes this decision as he's talking to go ahead, tear down his barns, build bigger barns so that he can have enough stored away for the future. I think it's important to note something when we hear this parable. Jesus does not challenge this man, critique this man, because he is just going for more, 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 more. No, if you notice in the little parable Jesus tells, this guy wanted to do more and more, but at some point he knew, I'm done, I'm going to retire, and I'm going to rest, and I'm going to take it easy. That'll be great. This man knows his limits. It's not perpetual greed that Jesus is challenging here. Look where the problem actually is. Look at the screen as I've highlighted it. Here's the story that Jesus tells. What's going on in here? The guy is just talking to himself. He said to himself, then he said, essentially to himself. And then he says at the end, and I say to myself, <laughs> this guy is totally self focused. He is totally self-absorbed. He is literally talking to himself. He is the center of his world, the center of his universe, the center of his focus. He is the center of it all. What do I want to do with my stuff? That statement is what Jesus is challenging. What Jesus is challenging in this man and challenging us is how does God fit into the equation of how we look at our stuff? How do other people fit into the equation of how we look 
at our things. From Adam and Eve in the garden to Judas betraying Jesus. A thread that runs through all of Scripture is this idea of sin. And sometimes when I'm teaching in confirmation or I'm talking to people like, what does sin mean? There are different definitions. One of the ways that I simply like to describe it is with this simple little image. Look at the word sin. What letter is in the middle of it? I. What sin is really about is my life turned in on me. My life just focused on me. No room for God, no room for others. It's all about Kendall. In many ways, that was the problem from Adam and Eve through Judas and all the way. God is saying, I want to be in your life. I want to be leading your life, but we say, I want to lead my life. I want to do it myself. Friends, this is the spiritual danger of money and stuff and wealth. It makes us self-absorbed and self-focused. And the farmer in the parable is confronted with this truth that he has ignored. Jesus goes on. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night, then who will get everything you work for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Steve Jobs was not a Christian, but he said something wise. He said, my goal is not to be the richest person in the cemetery. (laughs) But friends, sometimes seems like that is some people's goal. So how do we avoid being self-absorbed, self-centered, when it comes to our money and our stuff. There are three simple things that I think God would lift up for us to consider. The first one is simply this. Invite God into your money decisions. Seriously, invite him in. If you're an individual or a family that makes a yearly budget for your household spending, Invite God into that process. Before you start laying out your budget for the year or thinking through what expenses, say, God, how do you want me to look at this? And then as you go along in the process and sort of looking at things, ask, talk to God in the middle of the process. And then when you get to the end of your sort of budgeting, sort of, God, is this how you want me to be shaping our spending for this year? To get ourselves out of a self-absorbed sense We have to open ourselves up and invite God in. Before you buy a home or a town home, pray. Don't just talk to your mortgage broker to see how much of a monthly payment can I afford. Talk to God and say, God, how much of a home do I need? Invite God in. Before you buy a car and say, oh, this is what I really want, invite God into that conversation. God, how would you guide me as I think this through? If you're making retirement plans or state plans, invite God into that conversation. Ask God, what what do you want me to think about when I'm doing this? But don't just ask God, ask God, and then pause and listen for what guidance God might want to give. Invite God into your money decisions. You might be surprised at some of the things that God says to you. Here's the second thing, to avoid self-absorption. Share your stuff. I think one of the most powerful biblical models, mottos, M-O-T-T-O-S, I can't say it, but you know what I mean, is the line that God spoke to Abraham. Back in Genesis 12, he said, I have blessed you that you might be a great nation and your name will be great so that you 
might be a blessing. Reduce down, blessed to be a blessing. I love that phrase. In many ways, I've tried to take that in as a model for my life. And what I love is the two things that it does. Blessed to be a blessing reminds me, first of all, that everything I have is a gift. I have been blessed with my health. I have been blessed with my abilities. I've been blessed with the education that I've been able to achieve. I've been blessed being able to be pastor here. I've been blessed in so many ways. But then it also reminds me, I have been blessed for a purpose so that I might be a blessing to others. It's a phrase that reminds me to look up, thank you God for the blessings, and to look out to say, how can I be a blessing? So let's be practical with it. If you're someone who happens to have a boat, who do you invite to share it with to bless them to get out on the water with? If you're someone who has a cool backyard fire pit, who do you invite over to be able to enjoy that with? If you've been blessed with it, how might you be a blessing? There was a business owner at Light of Christ 15 years ago. He's since moved away. And he was doing very well for himself. And one of his prized purchases was he bought a Plymouth Prowler. For those of you who can remember back, it's like this classic old-style roadster car. And uh, look it up. I was going to get a picture. I forgot to. But it's this cool car, and he loved it. It was sort of his special treat that he had gotten for himself. But you know what he did? He knew a couple of the high school guys here at this church. And he said, hey, if you're taking your date to, to homecoming or to prom, do you want to use my car and pick her up in that? Their eyes got this big. He was sharing something that meant a lot to him. It kept him from being self-absorbed. I know a guy who loves to grill and smoke meat. And when he smokes them, he often smokes a little more than his family needs. And then he packages it up and Gives it to, uh, brings it down the street. There's a single mom living down the street from him. He's brought it there. Single dad living the other direction. There's, I know he's brought it to someone who just came home from the hospital. He recognized he's been blessed to be a blessing. And I think the third way that scripture lifts up for us to keep from being self-absorbed with our stuff is to give some of it away. Give it to God's work. Give it to other good work in this world. I'm guessing some of you have done that in the last week or two as you've seen the tragedies of the twin hurricanes passing through our country. You see, friends, when we think we control our stuff, but the truth is it begins to have power and start to control us. If you ever look at anything that you have and say, oh, I could never give that away. Think about that for a moment. Do you really control that thing or does it now control you? I heard someone once say, we never truly own something unless we can give it away. So let's just be real for a second. If you or I give just one or two percent of what we have away to others, away to God's work. And we're keeping 98 or 99 percent of it for ourselves. Where is our focus really? Have we fallen into the trap of what Jesus is talking about here? That we have become self-focused and self-absorbed. No one can actually tell anyone else what they should give from what they have. That's a decision we have to make between us and God. But maybe that's another place where we need to invite God into that decision-making in our lives. 
You see, friends, Jesus longs for you and me to have a rich relationship with God. Jesus longs for us to know the, the joy and the wonder of trusting ourselves to our Heavenly Father and not just trusting ourselves to our stuff. But he knows that can be the place that we begin to look to for safety and security. Trusting our stuff rather than trusting our Lord. Stuff turns us inward. Jesus wants to break us open and turn us outward to our Heavenly Father, and to one another. Let's not fall into the trap of being a rich fool. For it is in our Savior, in Jesus, that we find our value, that we find our worth, that we find our true purpose for this lifetime and for the life to come. Let's pray. Jesus, we come before you today, maybe a little like the guy who did all those years ago. We got problems in our lives and we want you to solve them. But just like you did to the man with the inheritance question, you point us to bigger questions, to bigger issues, to things that make us pause and reflect. Lord, help us to hear as you directed that man and as you direct us, what does it look like for us to have a rich relationship with you and with our Heavenly Father? And Lord, we pray that you would show us anything that is getting in the way of that. Free us from it so that we can live fully and authentically in your ways today and eternally. In your name we pray. Amen.